a very warm good afternoon from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. I would like to thank the members of faculty, non-teaching staff, and students of NSS College. I would also convey my regards to the principal of the institution, Dr. J. Anjana, Mr. Raghunath V, Dr. Jolsna, uh, Mr. Shibu MP, who turns out to be one of my best students, Ms. Remya, uh, Mr. Denny Thomas. Also, I would like to thank my other students, uh, Ms. Padmam, Mr. Sham Kumar. I would also like to convey my regards and respect to Dr. Sita Vijay Kumar and also to Professor uh, J. Prabash, who is held in very high esteem uh, in Jawaharlal Nehru University. Finally, I would like to thank God Almighty uh, for making this presentation possible uh, despite several hiccups and glitches. So, as you may know now, the title of the lecture the way I have titled it, the way I have worded it, is quote, India at 75 uh, could we speak from the standpoint of the marginalized, unquote. Now the subtitle uh, is, is, is a question, could we speak? So then I think we grapple with the puzzle here, a research puzzle here, which is that when India as a state is committed to social justice, when we probably have the best or at least one of the best constitutions in the world, the Indian constitution, with its explicit normative thrust on social justice, why do we raise a question? Could we speak? from the standpoint of the marginalized. Uh, so I'll try to address some of the issues, and I'll also try to learn from the larger student and the faculty community at NSS College. And of course, there are several related puzzles. There are several related puzzling questions, which is, uh, apart from the Constitution, which turns out to be a well-documented treatise on social justice, the other puzzling questions could well be, despite what uh, Professor Atul Kohli would call India as a successful democracy, uh, why are we still talking about, could we speak from the standpoint of the marginalized? Probably that is because the subaltern voices, the voices at the margins, are still not adequately represented. They are yet to be coherently articulated. Could they speak? Could the subaltern speak? Do they have the voice? Or do they have adequate representation? So I think these are the questions that we would seek to address in this discussion. Again, notwithstanding India's current characterization in the international system, or if you want to take the English school seriously, the international society, uh, India is currently characterized as, quote unquote, a rising power or an emerging power, or in, in the world of nuclear politics, a responsible state with advanced nuclear technology, call it whatever you like. Notwithstanding these characterizations, the voices of those who are at the margins, it could be the socially disadvantaged communities, uh, such as scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, other backward classes, the economically deprived, the economically exploited sections of society. Uh, if you, we could call them the proletariat. Of course, the proletariat have uh, nothing to lose, or it could be uh, 
the constituent states of the Indian Union. Uh, the, con the constituent states of the Indian Union, it could be Kerala, it could be Tamil Nadu, it could be West Bengal. In a way, these states, the voices of these states, the viewpoints of these states, the, view the perspectives of these governments, they are also getting marginalized. Or it could be the languages which are spoken uh, in India other than Hindi. What about non-Hindi languages? They are also getting subsumed and silenced amidst the cacophony of the mainstream or the dominant narrative. So you have a dominant narrative in place, the mainstream narrative, the orthodox narrative, which is to consider the sovereign state as a rational unitary actor. You don't care actually to get uh, underneath uh, the, the voices which are in fact uh, vying for articulation. So, and within this dominant narrative, India is characterized as a rising power, uh, as an emerging power, and probably the characterization is apt, the characterization is appropriate. If you go by Kenneth Wall's theory of international politics, you could uh, love Kenneth Walls, you could hate Kenneth Walls, but you cannot ignore Kenneth Walls. Then I think what matters is the relative distribution of capabilities. So I think to an extent to say that India is a rising power is apt or appropriate. But amidst this mainstream, dominant, orthodox, conventional uh, narrative, which we get to read all the time in newspapers such as the Hindu or the Times of India or the TV news channels, there are voices which are yet to be heard. There are voices which are silenced. There are voices which are ignored. Uh, there are voices uh, whose perspectives are completely out of the radar. So I think we would probably focus on those voices uh, for quite normative reasons and also probably for analytical reasons. Now, in this context, the main argument that I'm proposing, and this is a work in progress, is this, which is that as we celebrate, of course, the Constitution Day, I think it's celebrated on the 26th of November every year. There was an article in the Indian Express. I don't know how many of you uh, read the article precisely about Indian constitution on and the marginalized community. But as we celebrate Constitution Day, or as we celebrate Independence Day year after year, or as we celebrate Republic Day year after year, it is not just an occasion or an opportunity to uh, celebrate, but also to introspect. Of course, we could celebrate the uniqueness of the constitution, the normative thrust of the constitution, the anchoring of the constitution on social justice. But it also makes sense to delineate the characteristics, the features of the Indian constitution and to unpack the sovereign state. And in this case, of course, India. Uh, generally speaking, in international relations, what has been the rationale of the sovereign state? Uh, what are its achievements? Is, is something fundamentally wrong about the sovereign state or is, some, is everything right about the sovereign state? What about the culpability of the sovereign state in the pandemic crisis? Uh, or as Andrew Linklater would say, what is the moral deficiency of the sovereign state? Uh, so in, in the context of India, what has been the track record or the democratic scorecard of the Indian state? Uh, we could, uh, go back and recall the words of none other than one of those finest prime ministers India has had, Mr. V.P. Singh, who would make a point that democracy would mean, democracy would imply, and democracy ought to imply the participation of the people in the decision-making process. Now, along these lines, so let me get straight into the main argument and how we could go about in terms of substantiating this main argument. And the main argument is fairly simple. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, 
It's not convoluted. It's not complicated. And that argument is that the constitutional provisions are necessary, but they are not sufficient. So the constitution per se is not going to guarantee uh, social justice. And that is why you do find uh, a disconnect between, say, for instance, the abolition of untouchability uh, in the constitution, I mean, the text of the constitution and the prevalence or the practice of untouchability, even in the so-called socially progressive states such as Tamil Nadu, for instance. So how do you uh, square the circle? Uh, so three points for me, I think, how do I make the argument that the, constitu uh, the constitutional provisions are not uh, sufficient, they are necessary? I could discern, I could glean, I could tease out three narratives, three perspectives, which are often missing in the mainstream narrative. And the first one is the marginalization of the constituent states of the Indian Union. Now, what, what kind of a state is India exactly? So you, we, we could say that India is a federal state, but maybe it is not apt. You would have political scientists such as uh, Professor Rekha Saxena from Delhi University saying it's actually not federal. It's an, it's an asymmetrical federalism that you really have. Uh, maybe it is not even uh, asymmetrical federalism. It is quasi-federal. But if you actually get into the practice of the manner in which the central government, what the DMK now calls it as a union, not the center, because center would mean a privilege, right? So India is a union of states. The union is way too privileged to the exclusion of the constituent states of the Indian Union. And that, that is not how you have federal states in the international system generally. And this and, and this actually has uh, implications. It has profound implications. It, it may have adverse consequences. So for instance, when Tamil people are suffering in Sri Lanka, what is it that Tamil Nadu as a constituent state do? I mean, to what extent can it do? Because Tamil Nadu as a constituent state has uh, absolutely no role in matters of foreign policy. So this is a clear-cut exclusion. Uh, probably there was a reason, there was a rationale. Probably at the time of Indian independence, it, it made more sense to ensure that no states became way too autonomous so that they uh, secede from the Indian Union. So one is not questioning that. But I think, I think it's also important to note that the constituent states within the Indian Union, it could be Tamil Nadu, it could be West Bengal, it could be Kerala, uh, they are almost at the periphery, uh, at the margins. Uh, it's, it's, it's very much Delhi-centric, it's very much top-down, it's very much hierarchical, and one is not making a point about the current government. This has happened uh, all the time. Uh, it has happened during the earlier Congress time, uh, Congress government as well. Uh, the invocation of Article 356, the dismissal of state governments. And I think thankfully after the Bombay judgment, the uh, summary dismissal of state governments uh, actually has, has reduced considerably. I think thanks to uh, the judicial intervention uh, to that extent, and also the commitment of this government to, in a way, to uh, to respect the voices of the constituent states. So that's one thing, which is when one is talking about margins or marginalized communities, one gets an impression or from the analysis, from introspection, from an examination, that constituent states really do not have so much of leeway or maneuverable space 
to influence policy, especially foreign policy. Now, an interesting point to note is that it also depends on the nature of the issue. Is it a, is it a hardcore security issue, uh, which, for instance, uh, the influence, uh, say, of Tamil Nadu in, in matters of Sri Lanka, uh, then it's a hardcore security issue. Uh, maybe it has to do with national security. And on matters of national security, uh, you do find typical national parties, both the Indian National Congress and the BJP on the same page, uh, a similar worldview. But what about the Tisa River Water Agreement, for instance? Uh, so in that case, not so much of a hard security issue. West Bengal could actually articulate its position much more effectively. So between India and Bangladesh, West Bengal had its say. In fact, you had the uh, former um, foreign minister uh, who is actually quite dynamic, who was dynamic, I think, uh, Mrs. Sushma Sura is saying that we could never uh, go to the extent of antagonizing the viewpoint of West Bengal. So I think one can do a do two by two matrix, which to an extent I have done in one of my research articles in Third World Quarterly. So that's the first one. The second point is with is with regard to the languages. Now I'm trying to unpack the Indian Constitution. So rather than uncritically glorifying the text as it is, because you do find in the Constitution. Uh, maybe uh, subject to subsequent amendments, the privileging of one language over other languages, uh, the privileging of Hindi. At the heart of the problem is that when you have listed so many languages in the eighth schedule, all languages ought to be made official languages. I think that's a reasonable demand which is being made, uh, for instance, by the DMK government now. The moment you privilege one language over the rest, uh, despite the fact that English could continue as the official link language initially for a period of 15 years, and then you are in fact banking on, trusting on the assurance or the promise given by Jawaharlal Nehru, and that is an indefinite extension. So I think uh, all languages ought to be equally privileged including English. And I think this whole anti-English argument uh, is, I would say, paving way for another hegemony, paving way for another monopoly, paving way for another dominance. Because English, I think the English language could well be considered as a language of liberation. It could be seen as a vehicle for emancipation from a Dalit perspective, or even from a subaltern perspective, it is the English language, uh, which in fact could be considered as a vehicle for emancipation. I mean, I, I could be auto-ethnographic on this in a sense that I'm, tr I'm right now in a position to speak to you precisely because of the English language. Uh, so one could go back and uh, analyze the speech given by Dr. Manmohan Singh. I think at Oxford on the mixed impact of the British colonial rule and what was Marx's perspective on the colonial rule. So I think if you go even by Marx's own writings, while Marx would say that the colonial rule brings about uh, misery, and it did definitely, there is also, I think, a nuance in it, which is a colonial rule in India liberated India from a vegetative state. Uh, so minus a colonial role in India, then I think you need to ask a different question. Would the socially marginalized communities would have ever got access to schools, to colleges, to public spaces? Uh, so I think, so there are nuances and I think it's not uh, way too much into a binary construction. So I think when, even in international relations, when we grapple with questions of West and non-West, global North and global South, I think sometimes we are getting into uh, way too much into a binary construction, which is not helpful. 
Uh, I think a related point on this, I think whoever introduced me made a mention about social exclusion. And on the question of social exclusion is a point about intersectionality. How do you understand social exclusion? Uh, so social exclusion uh, could be along the lines of caste, but it could also be along the lines of class. It could be along the lines of religion. It could be along the lines of language. It could be along the lines of region. It could be along the lines of worldview. In the academic world, sometimes you are penalized. You are not rewarded because you, you allude to a certain worldview. So there are multiple axes. There are several axes of exclusion as far as social exclusion in India goes. Uh, and I think uh, now the uh, reservation given to economically weaker sections, I mean, I think that's a debatable topic. I want to stay away from uh, controversies. But then one could also consider that as a step in the right direction because you cannot deny the fact that there has been exclusion and that there has been more of an exclusion owing to globalization in recent times. So a class-based exclusion, economic deprivation, and if the government, in fact, uh, is doing what it is doing, which is to provide a reservation to economically weaker sections of society, it, I think it, it makes ample sense. So I think it is to the credit of the current government that uh, economically weaker sections of society are being uh, given reservation. But of course, the technicality as to what should be the income ceiling, how do you figure out who is economically deprived, who is not economically deprived, I think uh, that is uh, that needs to be worked worked out. Uh, a related point, again, is that when we uh, discuss emancipation, what is emancipation? Emancipation is liberation. How does Ken Booth, for instance, conceptualize emancipation? It's liberation from physical, political, social, and economic constraints. Now, increasingly, global politics is gearing towards a sectional notion of emancipation, which is to say that uh, this community is, is a victim and the other community is a perpetrator. Uh, so I'm, I'm being safe here. So I think rather than uh, go forward in terms of a sectional notion of emancipation. Anyone could be a perpetrator. Anyone could be a victim. Uh, there could be an entrapped community anywhere. It probably makes sense to think of emancipation, to conceptualize emancipation, to theorize emancipation, and to practice emancipation much more holistically, uh, which I think Professor Andrew Linklater at Bristol University uh, would say the emancipation of the species uh, in his uh, fantastic work beyond realism and Marxism, right? So, I mean, Professor Linklater, interestingly, mounts a critique on Marxism also because Marxism is way too deterministic. It does not go beyond proletariat, uh, but uh, axis of exclusion uh, is not necessarily along the lines of proletariat only. It could, in fact, be along the lines of gender, class, uh, ethnicity, and so on and so forth. So emancipation of the species would probably uh, make much more sense in this context. So the second, so the first one is about constituent states in terms of center state relations. The second one in terms of uh, questioning the privileging of Hindi all languages will have to be equally privileged and anti-english argument hardly makes sense as professor murthy would say english in fact is very much an indian language by now and and i think the language of english is is considered as a language of progress a language for liberation a language for emancipation and a language for advancement now the point the third point that i would like to uh mention and discuss is that rather than blaming the government 
or the or or vilifying the sovereign state it is also important to focus on the commitment of the society and as we see why the constitutional provisions or the constitutional safeguards are not sufficient they are necessary but they are not sufficient so what is that gap between that necessary and not sufficient has to do with the lack of commitment of the society uh, mr shibu is here so you do find for instance robert cox uh, talking about invoking gramsci talking about a state society complex uh, so it is not merely about vilifying the state uh, but the state society complex so rather than to adhere to a very narrow notion of state if we look at the notion of the state in a more broader sense uh, it includes society and i think the term or the concept that is used that makes ample sense is a state society complex uh, so what is it in terms of society uh, what is wrong uh, in terms of society and here i think we need to remind ourselves that people do have agency but there is a tendency then that the more privileged uh, the more resourceful the bourgeois if you would like to call them they are co-opted and we turn indifferent to systematic violence the society as as members of society are we questioning violence on women are we questioning violence on uh, scheduled castes on scheduled tribes are we questioning the deprivation of the poor are we questioning the exclusion of the elderly are we questioning the violence on the non humans on the animals for instance so there is a tendency to normalize indifference i mean in international relations it happens all the time a 2 year old uh, child uh, was killed in the war uh, on uh, on on ukraine so international relations does not care about it because it it it's 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 in the comfort zone of realism and so on and so forth so uh, in international relations people will have to be brought to the forefront similarly when it comes to uh, society i think we need to question we we what we do is we normalize a uh, suffering so suffering so there are there is violence here on the poor there is violence there on on women uh, there is violence here on the elderly population there is exclusion happening all the time what oliver richman would say everyday suffering so this everyday suffering has to be uh, brought to an end at least it has to be minimized so otherwise what happens is indifference indifference to injustice is tantamount to violence so it is not just about violence but even if you are indifferent to uh, violence then uh, th that could in fact would amount to violence i mean i think internationally speaking the genocide in rwanda between april and june 1994 when probably about 500000 to 800000 people were killed in in a matter of 100 days the fastest rate of uh, human killing uh, in, in 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 world history the international community virtually did nothing the united nations i think mr sham must have spoken about united nations at the peak of the genocide in rwanda the united nations troop contingent was reduced from 2700 to 270 this is the international community that we are talking about war in ukraine and there is an utter indifference uh, the fourth and final elam war in sri lanka attack on hospitals attack on children attack on women uh, again indifference even by the neighbors of sri lanka so i think there is a pressing need there is a pressing normative necessity to question uh, violence and i think it is in this context that theoretically speaking we need to change the system as it does exist now now one of the differences between or probably the most important difference between problem solving theory and critical theory generally 
is that when we are in the realm of problem solving theory, we are trying to make changes. Uh, but we are making incremental changes. We are making cosmetic changes, which are within the system, right? Within the system, we make some changes. Uh, for instance, even Mahatma Gandhi, for instance, could be considered as someone who is trying to make a change within the social system, within the social order. And that is why Gandhi was uh, not supporting the separate electorates uh, that Ambedkar supported. But sometimes making changes within the system to make incremental modifications within the system may not be sufficient. You need to transform the system. Uh, to quote Marx again, quote, philosophers interpret the world in many ways, but the point, however, is to change it, unquote. The very, because why, I mean, critical theorists would say, it is not just about change in the system or change within the system, it is actually change of the system. The very system has to be transformed. The very system has to be changed. It has to be modified. It can no longer be an unjust system, which is unfavorable to the proletariat, uh, to women, to socially marginalized. Uh, and, uh, and for instance, Ambedkar, uh, his work, Annihilation of Caste, is a treatise on social justice. Uh, but uh, do we really articulate Ambedkar's work internationally? Does India articulate uh, its commitment to social justice internationally in to, to the global world, right? Uh, so for Ambedkar, the caste system has to be destroyed. It has to be annihilated, and therefore annihilation of caste. Because Dr. Ambedkar was not theorizing from the air-conditioned rooms of universities. I mean, whatever Dr. Ambedkar uh, speaks about is from his experience. The best thing about annihilation of caste is that it was a lecture which Dr. Ambedkar was prevented from delivering. He could not even deliver the lecture. And therefore, because, it's, because he was prevented from delivering that lecture, he had to print copies and circulate and distribute. Right. So Dr. B. R. Ambedkar makes a case for annihilating the caste system. As long as the social order is in operation, justice is impossible. So annihilate the system, transform the social order. So and here I think what is important is you do find several uh, thinkers, uh, social and political thinkers, several practitioners maybe, uh, having different world uh, views, different perspectives. It could be uh, Mahatma Gandhi, and I think Mahatma Gandhi's worldview is as valid, as legitimate as anyone else's. The best thing about Gandhi is that he practiced what he preached, a stunning simplicity. Uh, it is not about saying one thing and doing something entirely different. So, but for Gandhi, I think the difference that we need to understand is, I mean, the, the, the Gandhi Ambedkar debate, in the words of probably the best writer, Arundhati Roy in Annihilation of Caste, uh, the, the doctor and the saint. I don't know how many of you have read it. And this is the difference. So you may have uh, Mahatma Gandhi making a point, which is to bring changes within the social order. And that is why he does not make a case. He does not support separate electorates. But you do find Ambedkar not being satisfied with this. He did, in fact, support separate electorates. And I think the British rule was sympathetic to that idea. But because of Puna Pact and the rest of it, and I think Gandhi fasted, and it has to be dropped. So I think questions of equality, empowerment, and emancipation would come to the fore if we uh, tend to transform the social order. Uh, and uh, there are any number of political and social thinkers. Uh, it is not just about uh, Gandhi or Ambedkar. It could be Periyar, EVR, uh, Mr. C. N. Annadurai, Mr. M. Karnanidhi, and now, of course, have, we have Mr. M. K. Stalin, uh, the luminaries of the Dravida movement, who, in fact, uh, make a case uh, for transforming the social order, for modifying the social order. And uh, the, 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 the resistance, 
the historical resistance to imposition of Hindi since 1938 needs to be seen in that light. It is not just resisting the imposition of language, it is resisting the onslaught of a certain social order, uh, which normalizes, which justifies hierarchy, oppression, exclusion, and so on and so forth. So, and you have others, uh, thinkers, other scholars, it could be Narayana Guru in Kerala, Rabindranath Tagore in West Bengal, Raman or Lohia. Uh, I think across the country, and I think we may agree to disagree, but I think it is important that in the spirit of plurality, in the spirit of multiplicity, in the spirit of variety, in the spirit of diversity, that we engage with different perspectives. We may not agree with all these perspectives, let's, but at least on board, let's take all these perspectives. The robustness of India does not lie in its singularity. India is not about one religion, one language, whatever. I think India is much more plural, much more multiplistic. The robustness of India lies in its diversity. And I think uh, the notion of emancipation which of course flows from the Western world. It could be Ken Booth, uh, it could be the Frankfurt School, it could be Professor Andrew Linklater, but I think it's now nuanced, it's, it's getting modified, it's implemented, it's internalized uh, in India in, in terms of notions, in terms of understandings, in terms of perspectives. Let me end with what uh, the current Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu says, uh, in Tamil, of course, I don't know how many of you could appreciate. He says, quote, Ellorukum Yellam, unquote. So, which would mean everything for everyone, unquote. Uh, so, that's the notion of emancipation that we need to uh, look forward to achieving that no one is excluded, uh, no community is excluded, no individual is excluded, not even the non humans are excluded. And that is what we should aspire for, which is the emancipation of the species, everything for everyone. Thank you so much.